Hi everyone and welcome to Legends of the Spire. I'm Dave and Happy New Year. I hope you've had a good Christmas uh, and start of 2023 so far. Uh, I'm back after a few weeks off. I've been finding more Chesterfield players to talk to uh, as I try and get to 100 interviews of former players and managers of Chesterfield FC. Uh, I have got a few lined up already uh, for 2023 and some that I've already recorded of which we start today with a whole new batch. And we start off with last season's uh, number one goalkeeper, Scott Loach. Uh, a big thanks to Scott for having a chat with me. Uh, he was uh, talking to me from a hotel in Cheltenham on a Friday night before uh, Derby were playing. Uh, so it's much appreciated that he gave up some time to have a chat. A lot of the conversation uh, was just me and him uh, talking about how fun that Chelsea match was. Uh, there's loads of great stories uh, from that. But we also spoke about his earlier career at places like Watford, phantom goals and England call-ups and things like that. It was great to get uh, an insight into his um, kind of thoughts on Chesterfield last season and what it was like being at the club. And he's now at Derby where, like I say, where he's doing uh, really well as both goalkeeper and starting on that road to being a coach too. Uh, as always, uh, I'm at Spire Legends on like Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook as well. Um, so it'd be great to hear what you think uh, and yeah we've got loads lined up over this uh, first month and going uh, through the year hopefully. Uh, hopefully I can get to 100 before the end of the year, you never know, we'll see what happens. Uh, but here we are with the first episode of the year with last season's number one goalkeeper, Scott Loach. part of Nottingham were you from? Because I, I went to university in Nottingham. Uh, I live in Southall now, or Southall. Okay. I don't know yeah. step from where, you, where you're from. I went to school there. I was actually born in Nottingham and moved down to Suffolk, well, Essex, when I was four, I moved back to Nottingham when I was 11. So, through to my, you know, my dad's work and stuff. So, yeah, went to school in Southall. My wife's from Southall. Um, although we didn't go to the same school and we've ended up buying a hat like we've been there for the last five years just because I've got three kids and it's quite a, quite a safe easy little village it's a bit like hot fuzz actually if you've ever, if you've ever seen the yeah. film that's the only way to, that is the only way to describe it mate it's, it's kind of where we live so it's um, yeah nice little area what's the matter Danny you've never taken a shortcut before I suppose it's a good part of the country to be based as well, isn't it? Because if if you like the nature of being a footballer, you can end up anywhere, can't you? It's... Yeah, I mean, I found that when I was even when I was at Hartley Paul and Barnet, obviously I travelled, but you bang in the middle, you're two hours either way, and yeah, it does get a bit grueling sometimes. Mm. But you know, when you look at the likes of your Exeter's, your Carlisle's, and you know, Cheltenham, for instance, Swindon's, you know, I'm quite lucky to be based where I am. Yeah, and it kind of explains a lot because I was looking at it thinking. Uh, you kind of started your youth career at Ipswich and I was like, that's a long wait <laughs> a couple yeah. of days a week to go to Ipswich but I suppose that explains it with, with being down there, what was that like? Yeah, so um, so you obviously moved down there it's a funny one because I'm a Man United fan but Ipswich was the first team I watched so I had a big bit of a soft spot for Ipswich mm. so a big soft spot for Ipswich, hence why when they came in for me when I was at Watford I didn't even think about it and hesitate, I went so um it was nice to go back there this year with Derby, but obviously I can't say that too much because like main rivals now for promotion, so I have to keep that one <laughs> in the wraps, do you know what I mean? But no, it's um yeah, it was a, that's how I ended up down there. Just it was my local team, so they were kind of the first team I grew up for and kind of played for. And were you always a goalkeeper or did you ever dabble in the outfield? Um I've been a goalie since I was eight, but I went on trial at Ipswich as a striker. Goalie got injured, so I just went, I'll go and goal. And the scout turned around and I, I I, I can still, you know, like you have like early memories. I remember there was one save I dived the wrong way for and I saved it, uh, it hit my foot, things hit me in the face. You know, one of the days where things just hit you and the scout said to my dad, he went, he's a goalie. So whether that's a compliment or a negative, I don't really know. <laughs> but yeah, so I've just stuck in goal since then. And my, da and my dad played in goal, non-league. Like my dad played with Braintree as well. And teams like that kind of just on the edge of the, I suppose it was the, um, it's called like the, 
I don't know what it was called back then, but the equivalent of like the one below the conference, north and south and stuff. So he played a decent level. So kind yeah. of just following his footsteps a little bit. Do you not have that? Did you find that you didn't have that fear then of chucking yourself at, at people and things or were you just kind of happy to get stuck in? I'm, I'm kind of like it now. I don't know, even like last year and stuff, like even now, I don't really think about stuff. Hmm. I don't kind of take all that emotion or I'm very kind of laid back as a person. I'm not, I'm not an aggressive person or I don't ever think stuff. I just kind of think, yeah, I'll do it. And it turned out that I'm not too bad at it. So I just kind of cracked on with it. There's an argument that if I did push a bit more, have a bit more aggression, especially when I was at Watford, you know, my career could only have gone a different direction, but I'm very kind of easy going. So mm. it was just, yeah, go and go and make a few saves. Yeah. And I suppose as a, as a keeper, you have to have a, a personality that can cope with having opposition fans directly behind you saying all sorts to you during matches. It's, it's an odd place on the pitch to be, I imagine. Yeah. I actually try and, join in with them and trying to try and like deflect it by like hammering myself like I've been called I don't want to swear but I've been called you know rubbish but mm. I've turned around and like yeah I know like, <laughs> like you know so what like it is what it is so um I just try and have a laugh and enjoy it I think you can see that with my celebrations not just at Chesterfield like when we score every every single club I've done that I get right into the game passionate about and playing for just love football even now yeah. like doing the role I'm doing now, just love training, diving around on that grass or when I'm coaching, like when the kids make the same, I like, I get proper enthusiastic and into it. It's just something I really love doing. Is there anything, putting on on the spot a bit here, but is there anything about football and everything, like in terms of a sense, like a a smell or anything like that that just makes you think, oh yeah, I love this sport. You know, like the smell of a, you know, oh, the you, smell you, of you, cut grass and, and stuff like that. Is there anything that... Like, I, I could probably this. speak for I could probably speak for the majority of the goalkeepers union, and we actually did have it yesterday. You know, when you get a new pair of gloves, mm-hmm. and me and Joe, we have a goalie. You, you've got a new pair of gloves. I think it might be this morning actually. And Mendes Lang was watching us try them on, and he was like, "You look weird." I'm like, "Oh, you can't." I was like, "Honestly, you can't <laughs> beat that feel." It's like a new pair of gloves. It's like the smell of the latex and stuff. And yeah, yeah. you know, it's it's something that. Whether it goes back to you getting your first pair as a kid, I don't really know, but it's just that you can't beat when you put your hands in that fresh glove. My, in my opinion, I, mean, I think I speak mm. for probably for a lot of goalkeepers. Yeah, and I was I was speaking to a writer recently, uh, Daniel Gray, who writes a lot about kind of the amazing nostalgic things about football, and there is the, you know, it's like the collecting the stickers and the yeah. like the smells and the clunk of a turnstile and all that stuff. It is there's there's loads of things, isn't there, in the sport that shouldn't be important but or, or make it what it is yeah and I think another one for me is like you know when you've had a really good session or like you've worked on, you know like there's a goal you get wet and you get muddy you know when you're walking in and your clothes are almost sticking to you a bit you think yeah I've done I've done done a bit today mm. like there's that feel as well that I think you ne- never want to lose because one day you are going to lose it do you know what I mean but it's like yeah. that that feeling is um of work and just being out on the grass is, is something special in my opinion yeah so what was it like kind of finding your feet then and getting your getting your first proper contract? Because was it was it Lincoln, first proper contract? Um, my first proper one, really, was probably Watford. I did my youth team at Lincoln, if you can't class as pro. Oh, okay. I went to Lincoln. Um, and it was funny, actually, because I only live 20 miles from Lincoln, but I had to stay in digs. <laughs> uh, I found it really difficult, actually, moving away moving away from home. I think because at that time, all my friends were starting off to go off to college or do other things, do parties and stuff like that. And I was, I was away in digs, found it tough. I had a really good set of lads. The first team, they were excellent. Obviously, times have changed, but some of the stuff we had to do, like getting locked in the boot room and stuff, yeah, probably can't go into too much of it. But <laughs> that kind of made me grow up a lot. Um, bearing in mind, I've just turned 16. Um, and then it was kind of different back then. It was like, you didn't have your 23s and your stuff like that you have now. It was reserves for his first team. And... I actually got to play in a reserve game but everyone came to watch Jack Hobbs and, and just happened to do really well. I only ever played one reserve game to do really well and because I'm quite a big lad for my age and stuff. And then then got scouted by Watford and that's where I went down for a trial and then the rest is history, really. Yeah. And was that 50 grand? Is that right? I To this day, I've heard 100 grand, I've heard 150 oh. and I've heard 60. So if, if if we go 150, it makes me sound better. So yeah. but I honestly, <laughs> honestly don't know and I didn't really care, to be honest. It was... Um, I got offered a four and a half year, year deal at 18. It was like, come on, this is like the best thing ever. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. 
God, that must have been amazing. So did you have to so who were your dicks uh people like? Was it like a oh, like an old couple or anything like that? No, it was a young it was a family and she had three young kids. Uh, her name was Susie and the, and the guy was called Dennis. And honestly, I, I don't think it was for them. Things could have gone differently. Like I still speak to Susie now. They were honestly incredible, like incredible, incredible people. Like really made me if I if I got in after training and no one was in and I was in the living room watching telly, for instance. It wouldn't ever feel awkward. They'd just go and do their own thing, or they literally yeah. took me on as one of their kids. Um, um, you know, I can't speak highly enough of them of putting me, I suppose, on that like path of growing up as a man as well, being away from home. They didn't try and she almost mothered me, but at the same time, kind of, and made me feel welcome, and, put, and then just also let me get on with it. It wasn't very strict or strict or anything like that. It was like you've got to learn. I've just got to, you know what I mean? Put, put a roof over your head and look after you, kind of thing. Yeah. And then to get a big contract and then have to, I suppose you're off to London, aren't you? So that must have been must have been interesting. You find it hard to not get distracted by bright lights or anything like that. Did you just kind of knuckle down with the football and everything? Well, this sums me up. In the whole time I was at Watford, seven odd years, I probably went to London less than 20 times, mate. I just can't stand the place. <laughs> Even when I was at Barnet, that's where I travelled. Like, literally, I'm, I'm very easy going. It's, it's like, it's just not for me. Um, obviously I had some good occasions when friends came down and you need a night's out and stuff like that which I think any young lad would do but regards living there I had a little flat in Hatfield which was just outside on the A1 so I could just bomb from down the motorway to, to come home but at the same time it was a, it, it was my flat do you know what I mean it was the best thing ever so um, yeah I, didn't, I wouldn't say I got distracted by bright lights I just mm. I think it's like, you don't really take it all in you know when I look back now I, don't, I can't I don't really, didn't really take it all in just yeah. kind of got on, like again, just got on with it. Yeah, I suppose you do, don't you? When you're that age, you just get on with things, don't you? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I think I was, I had this little, it was funny actually, I had this little green fiesta. The boot didn't shut properly because I reversed into a wall when I was learning to drive. <laughs> um, I think one of the windows was electric, but I had to wind it down. And then I'm pulling into the car park like Marlon King, Barry Sensor, Ashley Young, Chris <laughs> Eagle, and it's just like, yeah, you know, it's, but you just let your talking work on the pitch and just had a really good goalie coach. And obviously Ben Foster was there at the time. He was an unbelievable mentor. So all, that, all the other things were irrelevant, really. So you had quite a few loans, obviously, when you were at, at Watford. One of them was at uh, Morecambe, I think mm-hmm. it was. And you saved a, a penalty from a fella, from a, an, a previous podcast guest and Chesterfield ex-striker, Martin Gritton. Mm-hmm. Uh What's it? What was it like going on those loan spells and stuff, and kind of finding? Well, funny enough, in I, w- I then went back a month later with Bradford and saved another penalty at Macclesfield as well. So within the same <laughs> month, two different teams saved a penalty. <laughs> but when I was a youth team player, Martin Gritton came to Lincoln, so uh, I kind of knew him. Ah. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of that felt really nice. But um, to be honest, Morecambe was a bit daunting. It was my first loan, my league debut. Um, I was miles away from home. Joe Lewis had just been there, done incredibly well. Got a big move to Peterborough. Um, obviously, went in. I made the debut against Stockport on New Year's Day. We lost 2-1. Like, nothing I could do, but didn't really affect the game, did we? Mm-hmm. And then it was that game against Macclesfield that I kind of won everyone over. And then all of a sudden, my loan got cut short because they wanted to buy someone, you know, because of the loan rules and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of the best thing that happened to me because I had a little taste of it. I wasn't away for too long. I wasn't stuck up in Morecambe. It was kind of like, that's proper men's football. That's where you've got to go. So it was kind of a blessing in disguise. And then obviously I got the opportunity to go to Bradford after that. And, you know, I could travel from home and stuff in Nottingham mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And, and was there for the rest of the season. And I, I don't think if it wasn't for the Morecambe loan that I wouldn't have had that success. And I think I got, I got some, I don't forgot young player. I got an award anyway at Bradford for the end of the season. Um, but I think that Morecambe loan put me on the right path in the right direction to kind of move forward. Yeah, and it's those stepping stones, isn't it? Because like yeah, at think... Chesterfield, we've had Aaron Ramsdale was in net for us when we got relegated from League yeah. Two, which is bonkers thinking about. Um, you, we've kind of had pl- people that have come in and gone on to amazing things and, and stuff like that. You kind of need those moments, don't you? Yeah, you do. And, you know, I remember playing against Stockport, actually, again, for Bradford. I had a really, really good game. And I think at the time, my goalie coach came to watch me and Watford were linked with Wayne Hennessy because he was just coming through. Mm. And my goalie coach went back to Eddie Booth where he said, don't bother buying. We've got a young goalie here that's going to be more than ready. And, you know, I went back that 
that season and after three games I was in the team and then played for four years on, on the bounce. So it's mad how football really works out. Yeah, yeah. And is it right that the first goal you let in at Watford was that strange ghost goal thing? Yeah. Which yeah. was really odd. I was watching the video last night. Yeah. It's, it's still, it's a baffling. <laughs> it gets worse every time you watch it, mate, honestly. <laughs> you you kind of think, yeah, it's it's absolutely baffling. What, what was that like at the time? I'll tell you what. So Mark Poom came out to head a ball out for throwing, went over on his collarbone after about 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, I'm on the pitch. And then, it, like, my first goal kick, I remember I must have kicked it from here to my wall away. Like, you know, you keep little <laughs> nervous like that. I was thinking, oh, God. And then they broke through. I had a one-on-one. I made a really good save from Jimmy Kebe. And then, you know, like one of them horrible and swinging free kicks that bounces all the way through. Mm-hmm. I'd one of them had to tip over the bar. This was all within literally five minutes of being on the pitch. And then the ghost goal happened. And I was like, what the is going on here? Like, this is... This is welcome to you know, welcome to the championship and stuff like that. So, and I remember putting the ball down for a goal kick, and the ref had just run back to the halfway line. And Stephen Hunt and I remember him running off celebrating. You can see it on the video, and everyone's like, "What?" And I get that the ref said the lines went in, but my argument to this day is like, you're in the box, you're still on the edge of your team. You yeah. you can see that it didn't go in. Um, we can just dissect it as much as we want. The fact of the matter is, it's a complete farce, isn't it? But yeah, it's no. And then, so yeah, so welcome to the championship. I remember, wasn't the one at uh, maybe Southampton once where it, it kind of went in and hit the, uh, I think it hit the advertising board and bounced to actually went in and was a goal, but bounced out. And I don't think the game Yeah, like goal. Hit, the, hit the bottom stanchion at the back and came back out. Yeah. I can't remember where that was, but yeah, it wasn't too long after that either. There was a couple of iffy decisions over them a couple of years that were, you know, didn't put refs in a great line, Mike. No. <laughs> and we've had some, you, you get some interesting ones at national league level, don't you? Obviously, you're still Yeah, I'm sure we could. So where where was it last year? Was it Solio at home last year? Or was it, yeah, we could talk yeah, about yeah. it more. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Curtis Weston, bless him. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and there was the Jack McCourt, it should have been a red. That's and, it. Oh, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, that was the one. Uh, yeah, there was, it's, it's usually always Solly Hull as well for some reason. Um, yeah. But there we go. Um, so, so yeah, you were under a bunch of uh, really good managers then, weren't you? Under Watford, you kind of yeah. your Malky Mackay, Aidy Boothroyd, Brendan Rodgers. Um, what was it? Who who did you find that you reacted best under, or were you the kind of guy that can kind of get along with anyone? Um, to be honest, Brendan was the one that. So I I, I owe Malky Mackay a lot for my career. So he kind of took over. So basically, when I got in for Watson and the Boothroyd, I had a really freak injury. I was playing at Bramall Lane. I made a save to my right. And it was one of them, you know when you go full stretch, but the ball sticks to your hand, so it's like your momentum stops. Mm-hmm. And I snapped my, like my, the muscle that connects from your stomach to your hip, snapped cleanly off my hip. So I had like a five centimetre hole inside my stomach. Um, so I was out for six weeks. And they put it down just to a growth spurt. And luckily, like, and it, weirdly, it just grew back. It was a it was very, very weird injury. <laughs> A before I got sacked and then Malky came in for a couple of games and I was just getting back to fitness and he just came up to me and just went, I'm playing before QPR away. Played, sorry, QPR at home, playing against QPR at home and Bristol City were on Tuesday in which Brendan Rodgers was in the stand and to be fair, Brendan came down and just said, I know enough about you, I've seen you so I'm going to stick with you. So Malky gave him that initial chance and Brendan believed in, in young players at the time because obviously he'd been working at Chelsea and he brought the likes of Jack Court and Ian Bridcup to the team, so they're quite in the squad. And he he was way before his time, mate, Brendan was. He was mm. doing possession drills and playing out from the back just before it started. And, you know, he was very, very good. And obviously the club had its own, uh, financial troubles and there was stuff going on in the background. So he actually left to Reading, in which Malky took over. And I played every game for Malky, every single game. So I think over two years, and he was unbelievable. Mm. Um, really, really good manager in the fact that he could manage young players and old players the same. He never kind of favouritised anyone. Um, the schedule, you knew what you're doing every week and when you were doing it. Um, you knew on the training pitch, he was the boss. And he would, I'll tell you what, he wouldn't be afraid to give you some. But then off the pitch, he was your mate. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. got on probably the best and did my best with Melky. And then Daishi took over. Uh, and I think Daishi is an unbelievable bloke. He's a great, like, honestly, one of the funniest guys, one of the most detailed guys ever. And, but weird, as player manager, we didn't see eye to eye. Mm. 
but outside of football, and I used to give him a lift back to Northampton, and I know his son really well now and stuff like that. I can't speak highly enough of him. And I think as an actual manager and details, he was probably the best. But we didn't see eye to eye to play managers. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So he obviously brought Thomas Kuzak in, but I have no issue with that. It's business at the end of the day. He's got to get what he wants for the team. And I actually learned a lot off Thomas Kuzak, who'd come from Man United at the time. So um, difficult to pick a best one between them all because they all have their qualities. But mm. I'd say finer details for me and the way he went into things, I'd probably say Dice, he edged it, but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. But then I'm the best time in the Melky. So do you know what I mean? It's kind of just trying to kind of it's, it's really hard to balance it out yeah yeah totally and it was like like you said it was 130 consecutive appearances was it something like that yeah i think i played something like 153 out of 155 games or something yeah so what's Which it like when you just find you you're just finding your rhythm i suppose you do you just ride a bit of a crest of a wave when that's you happening? do yeah that's exactly it you know when you're a young lad it's just adrenaline adrenaline just gets you through you don't overthink it you don't think about anything else. There was no, but do you know what helped me as well? There was no Instagram, there was no Twitter, there wasn't any, mm. until I went to Ipswich, there was none of that. So, if people were caning me and hammering me, I'd never hear about it. Or, whereas now, you can have a bad game or you can have a good game, but there's still 10 people that think you're rubbish. Yeah. And you, you definitely know about it on the Saturday night. So, I didn't have any of that. Um, so, I think that obviously helped as well. Because, you can't say as a 22-year-old that it wouldn't affect you. You don't know, do you, unless you're in that no, world. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah so for me it was just literally like I remember one time I can't remember who played on the Saturday but I knew we was playing Doncaster the following Saturday at home and I remember telling my mate on the way home I was like I can't wait for next Saturday like the game had only just finished <laughs> but you know I just love that buzz of being out on the pitch um, so yeah I think I just got through it on pure adrenaline and obviously alongside that then like some international recognition which is nice so you got like 14 under 21 yeah. caps and you were in a, a three England yeah, squad, three was squads, it? Yeah, three So, I mean, that must, have been, yeah. that must have been ace just to be part of that. Yeah, again, like, again, it's not really until I've got a mate called, I'm going to give a shout-out called Jordan. And it wasn't until literally a couple of months ago, he had a bit of a dig at me. And he was like, you can't collect shirts or memorabilia and stuff. But they've all been in my loft or my garage or whatever. Yeah. And he's like you've done good things like you've got you know because again I don't really playing for England is great it's great recognition it's like yeah it's okay, you know it's my job do you know what I mean and it's not until he basically made me get all my stuff out I've started to look back a little bit and gone yeah or, or, you know alright like as daft as it sounds I'm sure we'll get to it the best I've ever felt in my career is when we played against Chelsea last year <laughs> Um. And I'm sure we'll get to that later on, and then I'll explain later on. But that, if you if you think of all the England stuff and that, that's that's a, the only moment I probably walked off the pitch, or walked over the crowd and thought, yeah, I've done something here. Yeah, which is really bizarre. But I'll explain my reasons, obviously, why. Yeah, we... yeah totally. Okay. Yeah. No, it's great. I mean, it's funny as well. I've spoken to loads of footballers, and they say that they are, they sometimes talk about. Uh, you know how fans might come up to them in the street and say, do you remember that goal you scored against Shrewsbury in 1994? And I've had ones that have gone before and said, oh, at the, t- at the time I'll go, yeah, yeah, I remember- oh, yeah, well, what a great goal that was. And they'll be like, don't remember it. It's just like, it's just a job. I'm <laughs> yeah. in, I almost in, get, in I almost get like a little bit embarrassed when I talk about it. It's just like, I can't put a picture frame up or plumb a toilet or I haven't changed a bloody plug in my house. My wife does everything. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm literally like Barry Daycare because I'm used to everything else. I'm just lucky that football's probably more globalised and yeah. you know and out there. So it's kind of like, well, yeah, I can play in goal, but you should see me try and climb a ladder to get in the loft. It's incredible. So it's, you know what I mean? It's <laughs> for me, it's just a job. And, and like like you said in this podcast, though, if you asked me to do it, I'd still be trying to work it out. So it's like everyone's got their own, you know, different thing and. I'm just guessing fortunate that I'm in the football world, hence why I make the most of it every single day. Yeah, totally, yeah. So let's whiz forward a bit. So you've obviously had spells then. Ipswich, which you yeah. mentioned must have been lovely going back to Ipswich. Uh, Rotherham, Notts County. Notts County, that, that must be nice for the travel. <laughs> oh, God, it was a dream, yeah. Uh, it was weird for Notts County because I went in to replace Roy Power and he was obviously playing. Uh, I don't know Kevin Dilberton, who's still a really good friend of mine. Um, unbelievable guy, unbelievable golden coach. 
he wanted to bring me in to kind of take over from Roy and said, look, you will get in. And I did get in and I finished really strongly at Notts that first year. And then what I found, it was my first time in League Two. So what I found when managers chop and change, don't they? When John, John Sheridan came in mm. and he brought his own players in his own team, which is fine, absolutely fine. It's what happened. So that was kind of like, right, I've all of a sudden gone from playing this level to that level. Now I'm not playing. Shit, what do I do? Do you know what I mean? It's kind yeah, of, yeah. and I'm not one of them. I didn't want to sit on the bench or be forgotten. And that, that's why the chance to go to Hartlepool came up. And I just thought, I don't care what they're doing. Mm. I've had a couple of years where it's been in and out. I just want to go and reinvent myself and go again. Yeah, I suppose you just want to play, don't you? John Sheridan, yeah. tact, tactic light, fair to say? <laughs> I've had a few players yeah. on the podcast and they'll go, yeah, he didn't, didn't really tell us what to do. <laughs> just Jonathan yeah, Smith came on. The thing with uh, him, so he was obviously such a good player himself. I think he just, the level, maybe him looking at the level, he just thought it was rubbish. Mm. And it was hard for him to get his head around that. Uh, great guy, he brought Mark Cosby in as well. Unbelievable guy. Yeah. Um, obviously, I just, not that I wasn't for them, they... They just had their own ideas and their own team. So it is what it is, isn't it? But mm. all of a sudden you go from playing championship to league two because you want to play and move home to not playing. It's a big shock. And then Barnet, obviously, which is where uh, you kind of come to attention of Chesterfield fans, I suppose. Obviously, we'll have known you from yeah. years before because you're a well-known name. But um, Barnet doing doing well this year. Um, yeah. it, must be, it must be nice to see them do well because they had some tough years it's fair yeah. to say like a lot of us in the National League but they seem to be finding the way back again don't they yeah I mean obviously I left Hartlepool I've done really well there I played 100 in a row for Hartlepool my best friend in football plays Hartlepool had a really good time but they were cutting the budget and stuff you know with the travel and stuff like that and they just had different ideas as well and you, and you know I think sometimes you get to a, a club or you, or you play and you probably had it at Chesterfield sometimes your time's up whether that's after a year or five years you know when the time is to move on uh, and I had a phone call with Darren Curry and I knew once I spoke to Darren Curry on the phone I said to him I'm going to Barnet I literally I can't you know and he is one person I'd love to work with again just we just connected really really good guy enjoyed everything about working with him that's why I didn't care about the travel every day I just loved going down there we had a really really good dressing room um, we've still if you think this was 2019 2020 mm-hmm. the group chat is still going from that original players wow. um, so really really good team we got to the playoffs, obviously, whether it was by default and the old COVID thing, we, you know, with an argument to say we would have got there anyway because we had four games in hand, but it was a really successful year, personally, for myself. And I got every award there and stuff, and, and for the lads and made some good friends there. Um, mm. Second year, though, wasn't wasn't too great. Um, probably the lowest point in my career, I'd say. But I'm really, really pleased with the club because I connected with the fans there. They don't get too many, but they're loyal. And they're really good and they just want the best for the club. And I think they've finally got that now. They've tried, I think the National League, it's so up and down, isn't it? You just need that consistency. And I think they've got that now. And hopefully they can keep pushing and at least have a good run to give them something to cheer about. Yeah. And they seem like, uh, uh, it's probably one of those cliches, but they seem like a proper football club. But yeah. It, you know. Yeah, just... You know, there was obviously stuff behind the scenes at times that you, you question, but every club has that. Um, but if you talk about the fans and the history and you know that it's just a good place um, forget the ins and outs of what goes on a daily basis of a football club but if you were there you'd understand what I'm saying that I'm sure most of the players would back me in this that you can't really do wrong it's, you, you, it's one of them places you're not going to get food every week they're there to support you you might only get 30 fans travelling to away games you might only get 60 whatever but you know what you're getting, and um, that's why I think they deserve to have. You know, no one deserves to go up. You've got to, you've got to earn that. But I think they definitely deserve to have something to cheer about or some kind of excitement this season. Yeah, like all fan bases, it's quality, not quantity, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So you, you then played at Chesterfield for Barnet. It was a uh, it was a night in which obviously Asante. Uh, Kind of had probably. Yeah, I just got a goal of the nights. season. That was that was part of my deal. <laughs> so if I get a goal of the season, you get me to the club. So. Yeah, it was a it was a, a wild night that wasn't it? Um, yeah, it was funny that because I I nearly came to Chesterfield before before Carl Everett. How oh, did you? So basically, what happened was, so Bucky, who the goalie coach, I'm sure we'll get onto him. What's mm. a man, by the way, for many reasons. He rang me back to come in. 
I thought with Darren Curry leaving Barnet, I've never done it in my career before, but I thought I signed for you, Darren. He said to the chairman, I signed for the previous manager, he's gone. I want to leave, I want to go, I want to go back home. My wife's having a third kid, there's COVID, all this and all that. I just, we couldn't get it done in the end. And then obviously James rang me again about coming, couldn't happen. And then I thought, right, it's my chance I'll play. <laughs> Lost six and I was thinking, I'm saying to Hayden Hollis afterwards, who's a good mate of mine, I was like, <laughs> you've got to go in and tell him that's not usually a script. <laughs> like, you know, but, um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a strange one. I'm glad there was no fans in there, put it that way. Yeah, I think I was watching it on the I was watching it on the stream, yeah. like like a lot of other people. That's what I did it for. I just did it all for you to give you all the boost, so you could, you know, when, when I came in, that you'd, you'd all like me. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it was a uh, yeah, got taught a sort of lesson that day, definitely. Yeah, and and I think you've mentioned before there's some Chesterfield fans in your family, isn't there? Yeah, Jono Morris. So if you listen to yeah. Jono and his dad, um, they married into my family, married my cousins, but it's turned out that now I'm probably closer to Jono than any of my cousins <laughs> or anyone. So, like, he's a really good friend. Like, he's a really good family friend and a friend. Does a lot for me as well on my coaching side. And, um, you know, just just a genuinely good bloke. He's, you know, and he's lad, his little lad's now at Derby as well. So, right. it's, it's just a really good yeah. connection. But um, he used to say for years, come to Chesterfield. And then, like, there's a few pictures of when we beat certain teams. I'd always go over to him. And I think, Nine times out of ten, when you see the pictures and you stick in my hand, it's always to him. Do you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. uh, got a really, really nice connection with him. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like it was kind of fate then that you'd join us eventually. <laughs> you know, it was one of them clubs I always wanted to join. Um, so when it when the opportunity came, I was like, I literally couldn't believe it. And, and you're not going to believe this. I'm, I remember when when you lost in the semi finals to Notts County mm-hmm. and Monty got injured, and Monty's yeah. an unbelievable keeper and, and, and a great guy. I know Monty. I said to my wife, and this is hand on my heart, I said, I'm in. I just had a really weird feeling that I'm in. Mm. And then the next morning, uh, Bucky rang me. It was so, so weird. It was like the weirdest thing. It's like I just got a feeling that I was I was going to get the opportunity to come and play. Yeah. And like you mentioned, Bucky, so he seems to have risen uh, kind of right through the, the club at Chestfield to kind of get to... That position. Tell us a bit more about him, because because uh, we kind he's, of he's see him around only, a lot. But... He's the only. I've had some good goalie coaches, some very very good goalie coaches. There's a couple. There's there's probably there's three that I keep in touch with. Ross Turnbull, who obviously played for Chelsea and he was at Hartley with me. Kevin Bilton, I've said, and Bucky. And I still speak to Bucky today. He is. He just got me, mate. He just got. He just understood me. He knew how to manage me. He. Didn't care about like he let me have it as well. He, he knew, and he also had this really good way of pushing my buttons, probably without me knowing it, and it made me want more. And then he knew when to come off me. He knew like from the psychological aspect alone, he's definitely up there with the best. Like he's, I said it before. He, he just he just had this way of like he knew he, and even now. If he was speaking to him about me, if I if I said to him, "Ah, oh, Darby, give me three days off," he'd be like, "Well, you can't have three days off because you're a bag of sh- shit." After you need to, you can only have one day off. Because <laughs> I am, I'm one of them that needs more work to to continue on that, whether it's my age or whatever. Um, his sessions unbelievable. Like I can't speak highly enough of him as a person, as a coach. Hmm. Um, he definitely improved me 100. Um, percent I don't want to get too cheesy on it. I just thought he the only way to sum him up is he understood exactly what I needed and somehow he knew mentally and psychologically what I needed. And he, he knew like he knew how to rev me up and make me angry. Yeah. And then be like, yeah, do you know what I mean? And it was just 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 really good. But his commitment, mate, to the cause as well. Like, forget yeah. the coach side. He's in every day, he's learning. I mean, he's doing his A license. He's no he's no fool. Do you know what I mean? He's yeah, he's yeah, got yeah. all his, his badges and outfield badges as well he knows the game um, and he's someone that I'd love to someone just give him the opportunity because I think if he got into a higher club he'd slop he'd slop right in sky's the limit my uh, interest in uh, that I was in the match at the match the other day uh, go to the match with my mother my dear old mother and uh, and she remembers when he was a kid because she used to work with his mum <laughs> Really? And she was like, "Oh, I remember him when he was a little boy. He's done so well." <laughs> so... I will say this though, because if, if he does have a listen, he's rubbish at head tennis and he's cheat and he cheats. Like <laughs> they, they could be one that's ten yard, like ten yards, like a yard in, and before it's even at the floor, he's like out and picks it up. 
<laughs> like he knows how to he knows how to play the game. And then he'd wind me and Dylan up. And it but then we'd be like, Oh, it must be out. So he, he knew how to play the game and win his points mm-hmm. as well. So he's he's no he's no mug at head tennis. I mean he's rubbish, <laughs> but he uh, he knew how to win a point. <laughs> So how did it all come about then uh, in terms of actually signing for Chesterfield? Was it a, a James Rowe phone call, I assume? Or, or was so, it Bucky when he rang you? Bucky rang me and he said, Luke Gaffer's going and, and literally within, you know, normally these deals take quite long. It, mm. it was done within an hour. Because uh, they knew I wanted to come home. I was on Fur at Barnet. Yeah. Um, it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't about a contract or money for me. It's like, like get me to Chesterfield at this club. I've got a golden opportunity here. So it was done. I wanted to be there. Knew a lot about the gaffer from playing against him, the way he played and his record and stuff like that. So it was no, no hesitation for me. Obviously, knew Hayden Hollis really, really well. Um, so it was for me. It was literally a no-brainer to go there. Mm. Yeah. And what were your first impressions of the squad and stuff? Because we obviously built a very, built a good quality squad to have an, an assault on that title. Very, very good squad. Very, very good changing room. Changing room full of experience, winners. And just generally good people into one. Do you know what I mean? It was like the demanding training was good. Like even if you like Sakini and you Calvin Millers, you could see what the great players and Lawrence and people like that. Um, Ross Maguire, mm-hmm. technically unbelievable and stuff like that. But then you had Curtis West and Jumani, like training meant something. But then as soon as that that had finished, it was laughing a joke. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. and that's what I thought was the um, really really good thing about it. And everyone everyone just, everyone just bought into each other as well. Everyone got on really well. And um, I think with James Rowe as well, we all knew our role. So we all knew exactly what we are doing, what we had to do to succeed. And that was it. So no one could kind of stray off or while you were gone. So mm. um, we all knew what direction we were going in and we all worked together to do that. Yeah. Who, who, did, you, uh, who did you enjoy facing in from the strikers in training and stuff like that? Because obviously some some fierce power behind people like Danny Rowe and, and, and yeah, stuff well, like Danny that. Yeah, Danny Rowe... He, he is honestly what a guy for a start, but I just got to the point where I just thought I'm moving out of the way. He just, what, I mean, he hits a ball so hard, it's unbelievable. Then he just used to like, it always used to be against me that I'd end up facing him. He'd be like, you know, like you do four shots and the next goal is in four shots, next goal is in. I'd always get him and have that big smirk on his face. And then he, he would just purposely kick it at you, I'm telling you. He got to the point where I was like, Bucky, I'm not, I'm not breaking down, I'm moving out of the way here. So, if I could avoid his team on five or be on his team for five sides, that that was good. Uh, but then you had your dark horse in Jack McCourt, very, very good technical player. Mm-hmm. Would never really smash it, but just feel it in. Lawrence Los- McGuire is technically like very, very good finisher. And then you just had Cabs. I mean, Cabs could fall over and it could hit his knee and his chin at a go, and he just stinks of gold, doesn't he? <laughs> he does, he's, yeah. just, he's just one of them. And then, I mean, Kingy. Obviously, as you've seen, unbelievable. I could I could name them all, really. That that team was really full of full of talented players. Hence, why we had a decent little run and we could go at it. Mm-hmm. Did did Kingy uh, was he doing a lot of practice on stuff like free kicks? Because obviously this year he seems to have hit like another stratosphere because yeah, yeah, all he, those he, are just going in. It's ridiculous. He's a really good pro. He's worked on his game and his professional side and uh, you know his fitness stuff and. His technical stuff. He, he was always working, always doing stuff. And, you know, I've seen him put a few over the stand. Don't get me wrong, but you got to keep doing it, keep doing it. And he's a player for me. I, if looking from a neutral, we still he's he's the best right back in the league by mile. Mm. He's he's got the quality. I think everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, uh, but he's worked on it, and he and he and he continues to work. And it's all right having the talent, but the consistency is what he's got as well. So mm. you know, fair play to him. Yeah, matter of time, isn't it? So before we go on to a couple of those key games, uh, like that you've already touched on a bit, um, just like on James Rowe, obviously there's things happening that we're not going to mention. Uh, but just as a gaffer, how did you how did you find it and like preparation of games? Because like you were talking on the on the phone when we had a quick yeah. chat that his preparation of games was excellent. I, I really liked him, you know. I really liked him. I got on with him. Don't get me wrong. There was stuff sometimes I was just thinking. You are definitely not wide up right, but probably for it. But you know, he was so detailed to everything. And like I said to you on the phone, I remember playing South End away, and I remember going 3 0 up against South End. And I literally just said to myself, He said it'd go like this. 
I remember just looking at the whiteboard and if you do this, this and this, this is what's going to happen. But the amount of times you did that, like when we won one other way at Grimsby, at, at Grimsby mm-hmm. um, just every game, you just seemed to be like one step ahead before the game had started. Um, obviously, we, I know we lost to Woke in the main head, but you can tell cold Tuesday nights hammer down the rain that happens to big teams do you know what I mean not saying we're a massive team compared to them but if you think of some of the performances we had I didn't touch I mean I was getting clean sheets for fun but didn't really touch the ball mm. didn't really touch the ball I'll be honest I had a few crosses to come for um, but even Salford away like I made a couple of saves but we've gone to League 2 so I spent a lot of money and we dominated the game I thought yeah, yeah. Uh, I just thought I just thought the guy, the, the, the guy genuinely believed, right? I'm telling you now, he genuinely believed that we would beat Chelsea. He didn't, he didn't have it as a, an occasion for our families and stuff like that and go down and enjoy it. It was like, no, we're going to do this, 2 10, blah, blah, blah. He was like, we're going to beat Chelsea. And he genuinely believed in his mind, which is great, that we were going to beat Chelsea. Mm. And that's just who he was. And, you know, I can't speak for whatever went on or whatever. And don't get me wrong, people clash and people do things and, we all know he, he could rant and rave and stuff. And But as a coach and as a manager, I liked him. I think I knew where I stood. He knew what he wanted. Um, and, I, and I just thought he was destined to go on to, you know, big things. But obviously things happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And some of those games. So you mentioned South End. That was the match when there was like the pitch invasion because South End were uh, kind of protesting, weren't they? Against it. I was fuming, mate. 17 minutes out of time. And I said to the ref, I was like, if they score another time, because I was on for like nine clean sheets and 11 or something. <laughs> I was like, you're having it. I was like, just fall in love, just call the game off. Just, just call the game. He's like, I've got to do it by law. And I was 17 minutes. And then a free kick in the dying, dying seconds, like in swing and free kick. And luckily it came straight into my hands. I was thinking, if they'd have scored that, I'd have lost my head. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, 4 0, like. But when we turned it on, we, we were good. That's what we could do to teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think in that South End match, there was like a bit of a camaraderie between the two sets of fans because Chesterfield have been there, like a lot of clubs have been there, and it, yeah. it's, it's you know it's just one of those things that happened, didn't it? I suppose. Um, so to go there and get four nil was nice because it's a long, long old trip for the fans as well, isn't it? And yeah. for you guys. <laughs> yeah, there's a few long trips in that league. Yeah, and it was like what seventeen clean sheets, was it? Yeah, I think. I think it yeah, 17. it was good. 17 clean sheets and arguably if you think of some of the stuff that happened I generally believe and I'm not knocking Cookie at all he's a great gaffer but obviously the different styles of play he'd rather win 4-3 than 1-0 but if James would have stayed we would have had mid-20s I think mm. that wouldn't have been down to me that would have been down to the team just being really really solid and everybody knowing exactly what they drilled to do yeah 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 and there was loads of injuries as well that season, wasn't there? I suppose there was at times yeah. when you could have ended up playing outfield at some point because <laughs> there yeah, were that many was... players injured. No one wants to see that, mate. Trust me. No. <laughs> uh, I turn. I, t- I think I'm like Ricky Lambert in five aside, but that's as that's as flamboyant as it gets. <laughs> so um, Chelsea, obviously amazing. It was such a fun day. Oh. I was next to this. I was stood next to a guy. Never met him before in my life. He'd been split up from his mate on the coach. We just had a chat throughout the match uh, about kind of how we'd supported Chesterfield throughout our lives and all that stuff. And when we scored, it was like the most magical moment. <laughs> like Everyone was sharing this hugely magical moment. Remember, it must have been remember, just fun for you guys. I remember celebrating. That's brilliant. I remember like there's two stories from that game of Kai Havertz. Hmm. And one, when we scored, he, he was looking at me like, if I have one down, I was just like buzzing, absolutely buzzing. <laughs> and the second one is when they got the penalty and they put it down. I know ZH put it down, but Havertz went over to take it. And honestly, mate, I've said to somebody, like, he smelled like a dream, honestly. It was the nicest smelling human I've ever come across this day. And I remember saying to him, I was like, wow, you smell incredible. And he just looked at me like, what? What are you on about? And to this day, I was just like, I need to find that perfume. Um, so that was two eventful things. But no, the whole day, mate, like, like the fans, for a start, I think they made it. They were incredible. Um, and for me, you know, since my wife having three kids, it was probably one of the first games she's come to. She left, we left the kids with our in-laws and it was like, she came down with her friends. Um, so, my, like, 
we could only get a certain amount of tickets. So we had a selection of really good friends there and my wife, my dad, my brother. And it was like, uh, so I think I had 10 tickets in all, but it was 10 of the closest people. And to see them up there, like having fun and like celebrating and everything in there, that was, mm. the, that was the first, not that they didn't do that when I was younger, but that was the first time it hit me. And I was like, yeah, I did that. I made, I made them enjoy that. Like it was, you know, that was, that meant a lot to me to see them and then to see all the fans and the standing ovation afterwards to get 6,000 people. Mm. And I know every home game you get a point off, but to put up with that scoreline and, and just be there to appreciate the club, it was like, you know, we've, we've put a smile on people's faces today. Something something a bit rare. Um, so I think that was the first time it really sunk in to me about doing something in my career, even though we just lost 5-1. Mm. Um, but the whole day was incredible. Um the night out was great afterwards. Me and Big Denton, me and Big Tom Denton in the hotel bar, <laughs> just basically started a party, uh, which was fun. Uh, but yeah, no, it's something I'll forget. It was a great, great experience. Was it a match then that, because I've thought about this uh, more, and I think when a lot of uh, videos of us celebrating the goal went over Twitter and you had loads of opposition fans going, why are they celebrating that? It's a bit weird. Uh, but it was kind of that match was more than just one match because it was a symbol of us being back again as a club after loads of years of rubbish and it felt yeah. like a bit of a celebration was as players was it was it more than just one match was it did it give you a chance to kind of look in a more rounded part of your career I'm getting a bit deep but I don't know so for me like I played at Chelsea before for Watford and it didn't it didn't feel like that whether that's because, like you just said, I mean, I can't speak for the previous season. Of when I remember when I was at Barnet, Chesterfield struggled that year, relegation, and, and just managed to stay up and stuff. And, and no disrespect to any of the teams or the games you go to. You know when you've done that for year on year, for a couple of years, and you get to the Bridge? Mm. It's kind of like, it's a reward for the players of your hard work. So we had to go to Salford and win. We had to beat South End and, yeah. and stuff like that. But it's an achievement for everybody involved at the football club on the highest level. You're playing against the Champions League winners the previous year. And don't get me wrong, they didn't pull any punches. I, I went and shook Thomas Tuchel's hand after and kind of like had a hope and got lost in it. I thought I was tall, but he's tall. And I, I just said to him, I was like, thank you. I said, I said thank you. He was like, what I said, for playing your full strength team. Because there was rumours that they weren't going to do it. Because I think that showed us as a club a lot of respect. I think that also made it more of an enjoyable day for the fans. Because yeah. let's say, for instance, you're 5-1 down against Chelsea 23s. It's a different atmosphere, isn't it? Yeah. But I think when you see Lukaku was what was he one of the highest transfers in the history, whatever, and you got you know they bought Havertz and Loftus Cheek on at half time, you know stuff like that, and I think the whole occasion was just massive for yeah. everybody involved, and you probably had Chesterfield fans there that thought that I don't know maybe thought they'd never see that again, or young kids there now that cut your sticker books and you go on YouTube that probably thought I'll never get to see that play live, yeah. and it was just. You know, for me, like, I got Timo Werner's shirt and, like, my little boy is only five, so hopefully when he, got, like, when he really starts to understand football, he can mm. put that on and go and play with his mates and yeah. just little things like that. And I know Gav got a few shirts for his kid and stuff like that, so it's great for memory to be, but they're things that can pass on for, for generations as well, just, just the moments, because you talk about high-quality international players. You're talking about the top of the tree. Like, I mean, you, you're watching the game, you're probably someone going to say, they're robots. They're but actually robots. They were massive. Like, uh, that's yeah. the, what I kind of remembered when they, they came just... out on the pitch. They were, they were all massive and they were all incredibly quick. And you just like, the first 15 minutes was a bit like, what? I, I, I said, you could, the second half, Werner scored and he was offside. A free ball came through and I thought I was getting this. And I, I said to him, I went, you are, and there's a picture on my social media, I'm not sure if you've seen it, <laughs> of us both smiling together. Because I said to him, I was like, you're so fast. Like the but you think the and that's what I was saying about like enjoying the game and not getting like I didn't get nervous I just thought I'm going to enjoy this mm. and like the ball's going out for a throw in the national league you're setting up for a long throw they're that quick to keep it in and all of a sudden like sh they want to attack you <laughs> like they were just all so quick and mm. it was like they were four steps ahead like, it was it was unbelievable and I think to be in that it, I think what it is to play in that game when I played there before like I said for Watford there was no social media or anything like that I think to play. And players weren't worth 80 million back then. Mm. I think to play in that game, I think for me, to kind of really hit the nail on the head, 
they're, they're global superstars now, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know, like, back in the day, like, I played against Frank Lampard and Terry and stuff like that, but it wasn't like it is now. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are, like, global, global superstars, and it, that's how kind of they're thought of. And for me, it was just being involved in that occasion and my nephew seeing, my brother's kid seeing, like, he was like, Lukaku's, but like, and, and you could sense that in all the fans, the excitement. They didn't care. They didn't care if we lost. Hmm. But the goal and the, the fact that we had a go and didn't give up and kept going. Norwich lost that season to Stamford Bridge 7-0. Yeah, yeah. Uh, other teams got beat by more score than that. Um, I think because we had a go and didn't show any fear and they respect us, I think that's what made the occasion, in my opinion, like one not to forget. And it's tough when you think about, oh, you've played for England. Yeah, lost 5-1 to Chelsea way better. Hmm. I think it brought so many people together, in my opinion. It just meant a lot more. Yeah, totally. And and last thing on that match, like when they the team gets released, because I was with a load of fans walking to the ground, and you just kind of seeing the ground in the distance, and everyone's phones was pinging as the team were coming in, and we were like, "What? <laughs> Can you yeah. see, have you seen the team that he's putting out?" I imagine it was must have been was that kind of excitement then when they yeah, put honestly, out that team so when, rather when, than when, um, and like I said, yeah, when they played Bourne Wood. And we drew one one was it? And even at Barnet and Hartley, I always get I always get I always just get nervous playing Borough Wood away. Whether that's because the ground is small and the expectations different, like you should beat them and mm. and stuff like that. But I remember walking out of Stamford Bridge and they did that light show, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I was, this is unreal. Like I was like walking out like like this is like like un- unbelievable because nobody cared. What the result was going to be, mm. I think. I think, and, and by them naming that team, I think that actually took a lot of pressure off us. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you know, if they'd have played like, is a Harvey Vale and people like that, and I think it'd have been like, right, we've got a chance here, we've got to try and force a replay or whatever. It'd have been different, but I think because again, there was absolutely it was just pure excitement from everyone to mm. to rub themselves up against the best and see how they were, and you know, like the banter afterwards to. That Ali Whittle was like, you know, you're just trying to take Polish out of his pocket and stuff like that. Just all, it, it was just good, wasn't it? It was just, just good fun. And um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm getting excited thinking about it now. It's making me like, yeah, I want to play again instead of be a, <laughs> yeah, might go dive around my bed in a minute. But no, yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, what a day. I, I, but for me, the, the whole togetherness that it brought from everybody in there, like you could sense the emotion and, like the, the energy, like between you and I and the fans, and that everyone that day, there wasn't anyone that went away. I don't think that was like he was rubbish. You didn't. T- it, it was like, yeah, six fans of the view, twenty two of us, and it was like we were just one. And even at, like coming out of the ground, like all the Chelsea fans, you know, applauding the Chesterfield fans, and you know, you're getting high fives from them. It was like this. Just like this lovely harmonious moment, it felt. It was. That's, that, I think that's is, what it was. It was just like a complete one-off, like fairy tale. Um, and it just felt like not not that everyone thought this won't happen again. It was just like, well, we're here. Mm. Probably shouldn't be here. We can't do anything about it. So it's just enjoy the moment, like you said about my career and on in, the, in my age. Like enjoy the ride. It was kind of just like that. Let's just enjoy the ride. See what happens. And the fact that we got the last goal of the game just made it. Just made mm. it like. Just top, just topped it off for me. To kind of round off a few of those other games that season, there was like the Stockport two-two, um, and there was the Wrexham game where we absolutely thrashed them for the first half, and then they did us in the second. I came back from Sherwood Forest Centre Parks oh, what uh, place. T- to watch one of that, my top two favorite place on the planet, mate. Oh yeah. We, we were there for a week and the Wrexham game was on a Tuesday night in the middle. So I was like, right, okay, we'll drive back to Chesterfield. We'll do that and then drive back. I forgot how dark it is getting back to... Oh, Zen is that Park. when we lost 2-0 in the second, like two goals? Yeah, yeah. Last. And we, we played really well in, uh, in the first half and kind of played them off the pitch and then lost 2-0. Mm. Um, but it must have been... What was what was the dynamic change like then when Cookie came in? Because obviously he's a completely different personality, I'm guessing, to James Rowe in terms of the, yeah. uh, how they uh, do things. It was just different because you had your like your Curtis's and your Jim Kellermans were so used to doing a specific role, whereas Cookie's more f- fluid, isn't he? Like more wants to get forward, wants to get wide, and I think that transition was difficult. Of players kind of coming out of them certain roles, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And hence why I think the wheels didn't fall off. We just had a bad spell. Um, 
and different managers, regardless of how well you're doing, like certain players and don't like certain players. Um, you know, like as you can see, look at look at you now, like unbelievable team to watch and you the games that you're playing because he's got his own players in. Mm. Because it's just a style of play. And that's one thing I learned. It's not a per, it's not a personal thing that you get. It's like, you know, he wants this, he he wants that kind of thing. So yeah. it was difficult because he wanted us to play more, but obviously we weren't used to playing. Um not not difficult in heart in in aspects like it was un- unenjoyable. It wasn't unenjoyable. It was great, like great atmosphere. He, you know, head tennis every day, like lively, like good 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 staff. Um, but I think just from the team we had was built for that rigid three five two to win one nil and get us out of the league, and that was probably as far as it went. Hmm. If, if that if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Was it was it important that uh, Danny Webb was still in that because everyone loves Danny Webb. Uh, and he seems to have really settled into the town and uh, and everything. It's, it's felt quite important. Well, it feels quite important now that he's s- still there. Um, yeah. I suppose it's, it, when you're having you, that transition, I think you'd have to put Webby for me and Buck and Bucky as a two on the same pedestal. They're just two very very good guys for the football club. They're both very good at what they do. They bounce off each other. They give off an atmosphere that the players can bounce off. And I think that Stockport night, there's a picture of me hugging. But I think everybody for that night was so pleased for mm. for Webby. They didn't, I didn't care about the result on stopping Stockport's run. I'm telling you now, it was more for how Webby felt and Bucky felt because what they did and put into the club in that short space of time and the commitment, uh, every, everything that night was for them. Yeah, yeah. Top bloke. And everyone loves him. I think we all hope that like those two are going to be around for a long time. But um... Yeah, hopefully. Because good people, like clubs deserve good people and they're two of the best you'll get. Mm. Yeah, totally. So we're getting right to the end of Chesterfield then. So uh, Halifax playoff. It was an interesting one, that, because uh, how did you go into that? How did you approach going into that? Because obviously, as fans, we probably all thought, oh, we might not do that well in the playoffs now because we kind of, you know, uh, stuttered maybe in in terms of getting in there, like you say, because it's hard, that transition, isn't it? Um, But then we had a great game against Halifax. We had such a good home, home form. It was... We played them not too long before and we lost 2 0. But it was never a 2 0 game. We just gave away two really. And that, I think that was our problem a little bit under Cookie, in my opinion. I never actually remembered it again. We lost a few, but we were giving, we were doing stuff, whether that's because we weren't as rigid and so We were giving really bad goals away. And I think we knew that, hang on a minute, these are really beautiful. Um, and I think as well, going in, there's the dogs. We, we, we got over the line. No one expects anything. It was just like. And I think we blew him out of the water. It was 2-1. They scored, but they didn't really threaten after that. Yeah. Um, it, it was very, very comfortable. And I don't actually think I touched the ball with my hands, really. I think I made one save in the first half. It was offside. But I don't remember being caught. I don't remember having a cross or a cutback or a shot into me. I thought I'd be peppered, but I wasn't. Um, it, it was, I think, with the lads, we just had no fear. We got over the line, like we scraped it, and then we just thought, well, we might as well have a go at this. And I think that's how it just played out. And, you know, we had good players in the dressing room. And when you, you play with that freedom, sometimes it works in your favour. Yeah. So so we get to the get to the end of that season, obviously, South End, uh, Solly Hall happened. And they, I mean, they to be fair to them, they were kind of, what, 20 minutes away from being in the football yeah. league in the end? Um, and they're stuttering a bit this season, uh, maybe on the back of it. But how do what what are your kind of presiding memories of that season? Then looking back to that Chelsea game that's top of the tree, I'm guessing. Yeah, top of the tree. I enjoyed working with Bucky every day. I, I think he, he, like I've said, it. I won't go too much about him because it'll sound like the David O'Hare show. But <laughs> I felt like I learned a lot about myself, a lot about my own coaching because he helped me with that as well. Ideas, I think the way he approaches it. Um, really enjoyed working with him and Melvin and Dylan. Couldn't have worked with two better guys. Honestly, Melvin, Jesus Christ, like some of the stuff he used to do was outrageous. <laughs> like he'd make saves. I was like, I can't make that save. I can't. I, mean, I just can't make it. So I, ha- I have to be in the right position just to be able to catch. Like I have to work harder to get in a better position. Because honestly, he had these arms that just like, just just extend out of nowhere. Like honestly, <laughs> incredible. Um, really, really good atmosphere on the goal. So that was good. I just genuinely liked being at home, travelling 40 minutes in the car, going into a good dressing room with good people and just just playing football. 
I enjoyed the whole thing. I think the away fans have run real, by the way. Let's not be trying to suck up to anyone. I think they're very, very good. Like Dover away in that bottom stuff. I've obviously been to Dover away with Hartlepool were good, but I went there with Barnet as well. And then, like, you're looking around that like, good effort and then just spoke and the whole thing's packed out and got the size. Like, Jesus Christ, you look all right. I don't come to Dover if I got paid. Well, I, I did it. Do you know what I mean? But like, <laughs> I think the noise they made away, the oldest shot first game of the season, I was like, wow. Um, I, yeah, I, I, and I, you know, them singing my name and the song, that was, yeah, I loved it. Like, really loved it. My little boy and my little girl still sing it because they, they only came to one game and then that was Woking. Um, so, yeah, it was really, really nice for, it's always nice to get appreciated. Like, I'm not going to be one of them like, yeah, I care about the fans. Like, it's nice to get appreciated. Do you know what I mean? It's nice. Um, obviously, and, and you get some that like you, some that don't, which is fair enough. And it didn't bother me everyone's in touch with their opinions. But I, I generally enjoyed walking out there. And it meant, and obviously, I played my final just game of my career against South End. So that, yeah. I'll never forget that either. So I've got a shirt with 500 on, which is a Chesterfield shirt. So that will always be in my memories as well. Mm. Yeah, well, I think I like many other fans. We were really just. Uh... It's nice when you've got a goalkeeper in net that you can just kind of rely on. Yeah, I, <laughs> and you're dependable me, and, and you can I'll be make honest, saves. And, you know, honest, you can... I said it, but for me, as a goalie, and I love, God, I could get into We could do a whole just podcast on goalies, mate. I love, <laughs> love talking about goalies. I'm not going to make your worldly save. Like, I'm not, I know I make that. You, okay, you make a few because every goal, you, you go and goal and you make a, a worldly save. I ain't going to set attacks off and stuff like that, but I'd like to think like maybe six, seven out of ten every week. You know, okay, I might not do that one, but I'd like for the course of the season, I'd say he's a six or seven, he's going to win you 12 points a season. All right, it might cost you, might cost you three points here and there, but it's going to outweigh. But over the course of the season, he's... And, and, and that's how I felt as a goalie and I felt... I was able to do that in the team and, and, and the stadium and I just enjoyed being out there. I felt like I had backing from the manager, from the players, from the fans. Obviously, you hear a bit of noise, but you'd get that anywhere. Do you know what I mean? You'd get that. David De Gea gets it. Edison gets it. Every keeper gets it. But I generally enjoyed the whole process of being there. Mm. And I think it says a lot when you get the move to Derby. Everyone was uh, kind of like, oh, that's a shame, but you know, we're happy for him. There was kind of that nice uh, yeah. kind of mutual respect kind of thing happening. I, would have, I think we'd have loved to have seen you there for another yeah. season. But like you say, you can't uh, stand in someone's way when... Uh, no, you know. it was... I knew as well. I knew, and fair play to Cookie, I knew that I wasn't his choice of goalie. You know, I know he wanted someone with a higher line and, and to do stuff, but I probably can't do it. And, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but... I've got a lot of respect for him because he he didn't stand in my way or make anything awkward. He wanted to help me out as well, so he was great. And and when Derby came in and a chance to come in, I was like I said originally as a free, as a training keeper, but they were going to put me for my coaching badges and to train. I, I know David McGoldrick and Richard Stearman from my younger deck, like, but to work with Connor Hurahan and, and and players like that at 34 and give, be given that opportunity, I was like I have to I have to take this. I have to go for it. And then. When you when I trained when I'm there pre season, I've been in a day and then the senior's like, Oh, you're playing twenty minutes against Hereford Berlin on Saturday. I was like, What? Like, just oh. you just like, Whoa, right park and then you're thinking they're gonna bring a number two in, they're gonna bring a number two and they're not brought it in and it went longer and longer and eventually the two comes in and breaks his arm and you're making your debut in a papa drop. It's like it's just my mental how football works and it's just it's just an opportunity for me for longevity that's been been something that I wanted to try and wanted to go for and actually really, really enjoying the role that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So what's the, so you, I suppose you get to start to get, uh, you're a goalkeeper, so you can go on until you're like 45, can't you? But you start, <laughs> you start to, I, I guess, think about what you're going to do. Get, you've obviously not seen me get out of bed, mate. So. <laughs> um, for me, personally, I would love to get my badge. I'm obviously doing some coaching in the academy. I've, I've done a, been doing sessions with the 21s and 18s. Um, I actually did one with the first team boys the other day, like Andy Warrington let me take the lads, which was really, really nice. Like, so I kind of like worked my way up from the from the pre-academy stuff. Um, for me, I'm, I'm here to support Joe, who's playing really, really good goalkeeper and almost like be, just do what I needed to do. Like, what if they want me to go on the bench? I'm ready, I'm ready to play. I know I can play League One. Like, I know I've played there before. 
if they want me to be a free and stay at home and train and do whatever and be there for training, you know, I'm happy to do it. But whatever I do, I'll be 100% committed to it. Um, just want to stay in the game as long as I can and hopefully make that that transition slowly into coaching. Um, if it doesn't work out, you might have to drop back down and go and play for whatever reason or, or do whatever you've got to do to stay in the game. But mm. I think I think at some point it's going to stop, isn't it? Like you can't play forever. And, my, and the point I'm trying to make is maybe call that Derby County and say we can put you on that that ladder to the next step. Yeah. It makes it a little bit easier to make that transition. And and you know I've learned a hell of a lot of stuff since I've been here. Um, so you're just going to have to see how it plays out, really. Mm. But what I would say is that I, like I said to you about, I get really enthusiastic. We've got a young lad that plays for England who's only 16. God, I love him. I'd adopt him. He's like a great kid, really good kid. Uh, called Jack Thompson. We've got some really good goalies, and you've got Harrison folks who's just gone around to Kettering. And you like when they make saves, like oh, you generally want them to like do well. Like when Joe has a clean sheet, like I generally want to see Joe get a move for championship or take us up. And it's like whether that's an age thing or where I am. Mm. Uh, like I said, to you, I just love goalkeeping, so I just want to I want to be there and be part of their improvement. And for me, if I can see like young Tomo come through and play a first team game, that'll be just as successful for me than playing at Chelsea like we said it will mean, mean just as much to help one of these come through and hopefully go and have their time I do I do I do hope that league kind of sorts itself out and gives the team more of an opportunity to go up because I've been at Knotts before so I've got a soft spot there I know you, the rivals but you want to see good teams in, in, in the league and no one deserves to be in the league or win the right but like you said if you get 90, po- 90 plus points every season it's, it's got to be some point where it changes Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. We don't want to be there as as long as Wrexham have been in there, what, 15 years or something like that? I don't, I don't my mate, that my mate might mind me saying this because I used to car school with him to Barnet and he's at Mainhead. No one wants to go to Mainhead on a Tuesday night, do they? No. He won't mind me saying it. And he probably, and he'll admit it, he doesn't want to go to Mainhead on a Tuesday night. He plays for him. So you've got to get you out of that league. It's, and that's no disrespect to any Mainhead fans or anyone like that. It's just. I'm just thinking of our record against Maidenhead. It's atrocious. <laughs> They're yeah, just one yeah, of those so teams, aren't they, that beat us? Yeah, even when I was at Hartlepool, I lost them twice. Yeah, let's not talk about them. Let's no talk point. about Maidenhead. You've, it's just ruining all the Chelsea talk now with thoughts of Maidenhead. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Grandall, yeah. thank, you, thank you so much for taking time out while you're in a hotel preparing for tomorrow's game. I hope it's uh, a fruitful weekend for you. Mate, apart from my book that I've got that I'm reading... Um, there's not much more I do really. I'll probably put Villa Leeds on after this, but you've, you've entertained my night, let's say. Excellent. And I'm sure you'll entertain a lot of people listening. Make to sure this. if you do a headline, you put Bucky as rubbish at head tennis. Okay, I will do. Maybe the teacher yeah. on the A license. Yeah, no, yeah. Ask him if they can teach him if they know what's in and out because he, <laughs> he struggled with that a lot. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think the great club and hopefully hopefully cross paths at some point soon or, or near future again. Oh, I'm sure we will. You know, there'll be a yeah. there'll be a pre-season friendly again at some point. I'm sure. And any, che- any Chesterfield fans want any goalkeeper coaching? I'm only in Nottingham and I have a goalie school, so you know, come check it out. There's a few that come actually from Chesterfield. So excellent. Is that all ages then, or is it all ages? Yeah, on a Wednesday night, and we do like day camps and the half terms and stuff. So we've got a few that travel over from Chesterfield actually. So it's, it's growing, growing at a rapid rate. Actually, it's quite good. We've got some got some good coaches on board. Um, and yeah, trying to give them that opportunity that I have because living out where I live in the sticks and stuff like that, you don't always get that chance here. So yeah, just yeah. trying to put them on a map, and especially with the social media platform these days. And I know I'm plugging my business a bit, but no. generally want to bring goalies through. So, mm. um, you know, tell them to give me a shout.